Hello everyone, welcome to our Tuesday Live at 5. Um, today we're actually starting a new project, or I'm on the explanation I put projects in case you want to make something different than I'm demonstrating uh, with the blocks we're going to do. But I have several things to share with you before we get started. First of all, um, the quilt that we just finished, the um, economizer quilt, I wanted to show you how I organized myself for putting the blocks together and how I press so that when I get the blocks all together it will lay down as flat as possible. So behind me on the wall you may be able to see the uh, project, the first four or five rows, and I've just, um, I've got a diagram I'm following but it really could be totally random and still be fine. Um, I have my plates here with my completed blocks, and I have a bunch of um, economy blocks. I've even got some leftovers that I didn't complete. I may complete them, but I've got a lot of the economy blocks. I've also got some of the four patch star blocks that we did last time. I've even got one that I, um, I, remember I said I was trying to make it with a dark star in the middle and light background or a light star in a dark background and as it turned out I've got some that are a mixture and they're still going to be fine. Um, when I was putting this together I actually had enough that I could have put this together but I didn't want these two light blues, the light with the blue uh, feathers in the same block so I separated them so I have two blocks that are a mixture of a light star and a dark star. Um, and then what I did, um, using the, the blocks behind me on the wall, I arranged what I wanted to put together for the next row. And then you may be able to see I labeled them. This is a, a friction pen, so it's going to um, erase with heat. And I just wrote on the back side of my blocks so I know which order I wanted those blocks in that next row. And then I've got um, a couple of them pinned together ready to talk about. Now I don't have them pinned the way I pin when I'm trying to assemble something and make all the pieces match. On this particular block, I want the point of my uh, burgundy square to match up with the point of my cream colored square on this block. So in order to do that, I'm going to match up the intersections and I've actually used my friction pen and marked the stitching line so you can see the point I'm aiming for where that intersects. That's where I want to match up. And I'm going to pin right into that intersection and then I can peek under and insert my pin right at the intersection where the two creams come together and I can just wiggle those together. Now that's my placement pin. I can't just take this pin and bend it because that automatically shifts all the layers and they won't be lined up the way I want them to. So that placement pin, I just keep um, inserted in the fabric and hold on to it with my thumb and uh, forefinger so that I can keep it stable. And then I insert a pin right next to it. And I can glide that in and match that up. If you feel like you need to match up the corners, that's fine. I often don't pin the corners, but um, you may want to. So you're, where it's most important in this case is where that intersection meets with the other intersection on the other side. And then I'm going to sew onto my fabric tag. And I would actually assembly line sew these. I'm just going to sew one of them so you can see because we have other things to share tonight. So when I get to that intersection where my pin was inserted, I want to make sure that I come across at that crisscross. I don't want, I'd rather come a thread on the inside toward the seam allowance than a thread on the inside toward the, the block. If I come on this side, I'm chopping off that point, and I don't want to do that. So I want to make sure that I come right on that intersection or a thread on the side of the seam allowance. And when I get there, sometimes you have to get um, my seam rippers usually close at hand, and I can hold down those seams so that they feed through the way I want it to. 
sometimes you can just put your finger on the pin head and help glide it through. And I'm actually guiding right on the edge of my quarter inch patchwork foot when I get to the end. Um, and notice I did sew over the pins, but I do slow down when I get to the pins. You don't want to knock your machine out of time sewing over pins. So I've got one of my, um, or two of my blocks stitched together and I've matched up where I want to. So let's open it up and see if they come together the way I want them to. And they do. Once I press this, it'll lay down nice and flat. Now in order to, for this seam to be as flat as possible, I like to press this one open because you've got quite a bit of bulk coming together with those seams of the inner square of your economy block right here. So if I finger press that first and get it to lay down flat, then when I press that, it's going to come together and it's going to flatten that. And also this would be where I'd use my acorn pressing pin to give that a little help to make it nice and flat. I would do that with all of the seams. And um, as a general rule, I moved my, um, uh, I moved it up a little bit so you can't really see it very much because I, I had it down too low yesterday. But I would put together two or three rows, put together two or three more rows, and then sew those two segments together rather than adding a row every time I get a row complete. That is another reason for marking on your uh, fabric so you know which row that goes in or which position in the row if it matters to you. It could almost be totally random and it would still make a beautiful quilt. So that is um, how I would assemble the blocks for the economizer quilt. It's not too late to make the economizer and by the way share with your friends that they can watch this on YouTube or they can come to our Facebook page and watch this later. Um, be sure if you watch on YouTube any of our videos to subscribe and to leave comments. That lets YouTube know that people are watching it. So that's um, a handy thing for us here at the shop. Okay, so a couple of things that I wanted to share with you. Um, I think it was a week or two ago I shared that there is a new technique sheet. It's called Traditional Log Cabin and it is designed for the Tucker Trimmer 3. Now, of course, anything you can do with the Tucker Trimmer 3, you can do up to a six inch size with the Tucker Trimmer 1. And so I was looking over this um, and I decided to, to play with it a little bit and just make a couple of blocks so I could see the process. This is the traditional log cabin, not necessarily in traditional colors, but you can see that you start out with a square the square is cut to size, the strips are cut a little bigger, and then you trim as you go. So you'd put on two strips, two strips, and trim, and two strips, and two strips, and trim. And you could keep going until this reaches up to a 12-inch finished block. I stopped with a 5-inch finished block just to show you how that's put together. I also was playing with the um, one-sided log cabin, or sometimes it's called a half log cabin where you start with a center square, it's actually on the corner, and you add two strips, and then you add two strips on the same side, and two strips on the same side, and you start building it that way. That is um, a technique that's possible with the traditional log cabin instructions. The video is uh, coming soon, so there's not yet the video, but the instructions and the description of how you use your Tucker trimmer to make the, the traditional log cabin are very helpful. So I wanted to share that with you. Then um, I wanted to share my fabric pulls for the next project. And if you notice at the beginning of the video, I labeled our next project duck, duck, goose. And guess what we're gonna make a lot of? A lot of flying geese and some other project or some other units too. But I labeled it duck, duck, goose and it's um, a little bit of a mystery because you don't know what you're going to make with the geese. Um, the first block we're going to make, you could actually make a bunch of just this block and put together an interesting project with this same block over and over and over. As always, you can do that with any of the blocks that we make, um, even when we're making samplers. 
So I wanted to share with you what I pulled and some ideas about thinking about what fabric you might pull to play with. Now, first of all, you can make one block out of this series or you can make all the blocks out of the series. I don't have a um, complete fabric list for you yet with how much fabric you need, but you could grab some scraps and try some of these techniques and just kind of get started uh, with how to use the tools. And then when you decide on a color palette, then you can collect your fabrics. This is what I chose for what I'm going to play with. This, it, they're more traditional Civil War-ish types. Um, and I actually cut a five inch strip off of each of my fat quarters. And so I've got, I, I needed a four and a half inch square. But since five inch squares are fairly common in some of the things we do, I decided to cut a five inch strip off and then cut a four and a half inch square out of those strips. And so I've still got pieces of each of my fabrics in a five inch strip so that I could add that the next time I need something, especially if it needs to be five inches or four and a half inches. Um, I could even go lower than that. If I needed something three inches, I could. But that way, I've reserved the biggest part of my fat quarters. I'm not ready to cut all of it up yet anyway. Tonight, we're only working on geese, so that's how I organized myself. Now, I did kind of, uh, I had Tony go pull some fabric. You could decide to do monochromatic. Mine's going to be scrappy, but you could pick a colorway. This happens to be orange or salmon, and um, I said go pick three fabrics that are the same colorway, and you could do that. Um, tonight you're going to be making three sets of geese and you could do that one with each um, color in this colorway and they could go in the same block. So that's one option. Because of the size we're doing, you actually could use a charm pack. So this is a charm pack of um, batiks and I grabbed the batiks and I've pulled out some contrasting fabric. So I've got a print that's got several colors and then a print that's pretty monochromatic. These two are pretty monochromatic, but they'll work together because there's enough contrast there. And this is my um, set that I would make if I was going to make a set. And I'll show you how I did this. I took one charm square, trimmed it to four and a half because I need a four and a half inch square. Then I took another charm square and I cut it in four pieces because I need four two and a half inch squares. So with two charm squares, I've got enough to make a set of geese. And we'll talk more about what a set of geese is. Some of you probably already figured that out. So I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Now you also could just grab a set of fat quarters and um, we made some sets of black and whites. They're always popular. And um, in this set, it has 12 fat quarters going from light to dark. And you could always throw in a splash of color or a couple of splashes of color. So black and white and a bright color is always a popular combination. You could do lime, you could do turquoise, you could do pink, fuchsia, red, anything like that. And this was the day that, well, actually it was yesterday when the uh, UPS man came. He brought our two Lapri cuts. This is called Tiny Beasts. And on my screen, they look a little bit dull, but they are anything but dull. If you've seen any of Tula's work, they are bright and vibrant. Um, and there's three different fat quarter groups, and I'll show you. This one's actually the one called Tiny Beasts. This one is called Tiny Coordinates, and it has a couple of the Tiny Beast prints, but it's also got some fun dots and some fun stripes in her color palette that I'm sure you've seen before. And there's two different color groups of that. One of them is I don't know how to say it because this one's mo mostly turquoise and purple and orange, but this one's also got turquoise and purple and orange. It also has the lighter, creamy uh, colors as well. 
So there's three different um, groups of fat quarters of tulas, and there is um, jelly rolls, or there's strips. They're two and a half inch strips, or 10 inch charm squares. Now, because you could use five inch charms to make our sets of geese, you could also use 10 inch charms. So that is an option for you as well. If you have some orphan 10 inch charm squares laying around, you could always use them to do this. So that's um, fabric that you can pull to play with. If you wanna just pull some fabric from your stash to play with just to make a few geese, just as a review, this is not new if you've been watching our videos, but it's very helpful. Now, the instructions that come with the wing clipper tool, that's the tool we're gonna be using tonight, um, are very handy. Mine, I have a sheet laminator that I just ran it through the sheet laminator, but if something happens and you lose your instructions, you can go to the Studio 180 Design website and you can download an eight and a half inch by 11 inch sheet of the instructions. That's how this one comes anyway. But if you lose your instruction sheet, don't worry. What this gives you is sizing information and the process that we're going to do. So most of you, if you've watched us before, you've seen the process, but I'm gonna kind of walk through it again. I have some five, uh, four and a half inch squares that I cut of my um, Civil War-ish fabrics. And I have some four and a half inch square, or I said that wrong, two and a half inch squares that are gonna be the sky part. Now, if you look at your instruction sheet, it tells you those measurements. But there's a chart that I've shown you before, I'm gonna show you again. It's got the process um, in color, but also at the very top it says, if the height and the width, if you start with a one large square, um, an inch and a half larger than the width of your finished size, and your small squares, one inch larger than the height of your finished size, that's what you need to get started. So you're going to need one large square that's gonna be the goose part, and four small squares that are gonna be, I call them the sky part, the outside edges. So that is something that you'll be looking for. And for tonight, I'm going to use, uh, I'm gonna do the batik one, and I'm gonna do one with this background. And I've also chosen to use some um, light colored fabrics for, um, the sky part of some of my geese. So when I cut a bunch of them, I just kind of um, decide what I want to go together. I'm gonna put, this one's gonna be harder for you to see. I think I'll skip the black one for today and use a cream one, or a blue one, and I'll use a green one. And then I have my bright, colorful one that's going to go with my batiks. So those are the three I'm going to show you today. You're actually going to want to make three sets of geese that coordinate for um, a block. They're gonna go in the same block. But for demonstration purposes, I'm just using three of um, the fabrics that I'm playing with. So I like to use a fine point pen. This is a, a pen called Le Pen. It's just a gel marker, a permanent gel marker. And because of the size I'm making, I can use my half uh, Quilter's Magic Wand. The etched line is going point to point, and I'm going to draw the line on both sides of my Quilter's Magic Wand. And I draw as lightly as I can and still uh, manage to be able to see what I'm working with. So I'm just gonna and Tony says, you can't see what I'm doing. So, there we go. So, by the way, if you have questions or comments or just a shout out and tell us where you're from, um, Tony's monitoring the comment line. So, if you have something you need to share with us, she does see it. So, we're going to um, just draw two lines on both sides of the Quilter's Magic Wand on all of our squares. I should have done this beforehand so I'd have at least some of this done because you've seen me do this before if you've watched us before. Um, I know we have some new people because we had um, a 
big number jump up with watching our YouTube tutorial from last week. So that was kind of nice. So I know there are some new people that are watching that one. I didn't do a very good job because I didn't do it dark enough for me to be able to see. And then I did it again and moved it just enough that it almost looks um, a little blurry. But I'm going to draw my lines on. By the way, um, th there are, um, you can put a sandpaper disc, you can put um, the Invisigrip, thank you, Cliff was helping me there, um, Invisigrip on the back of your Quilter's Magic Wand. This has got just a tiny little piece of Invisigrip and that just kind of helps keep your Magic Wand from slipping if you have an issue with that. So now this, I wanted to show you um, this one because this is the one that I cut from a five inch charm square. Notice it's got two sides that are pinked edges. That's not going to be a problem because the way we do um, our flying geese, we're going to make them oversized and we're going to trim them down. So I'm just putting my two lines on both sides of my Quilter's Magic Wand on all of my pieces. So for um, the block we're making for this week, um, like I said, it's kind of a, a mystery because these are not the only units that are in our block. But you may decide to make these three sets of geese and put them together and not do the unit that I'm going to show you next week. Um, and then as time goes on, I'll share with you kind of where we're headed with what we're making. So now I'm ready to stitch together. I've got to move my chair because I'm sliding. Um, we're going to stitch together our pieces. So the first thing I'm going to do is grab my large square and I'm going to align my small square up on the top of my square. Notice I'm leaving a little space at the edge. I want to make sure I do that. That gives me a little more wiggle room when it's time to trim. This line you may not be able to see as well. I can see it, but I didn't draw it very dark. You may not be able to see it as well on the screen, but that's the line that I'm following. And I stitch about halfway across that square. And then I'm going to grab another square and I'm going to line it up. And on this one, I'm leaving my space at the end of my square because it's just two or three threads. You don't have to fuss with it. You're just going to line that up and leave yourself a little bit of wiggle room on the edge of your, your small square. If you feel the need to uh, pin this, you sure could. I don't, but some people like to pin. You could even use the seam line glue and glue it. Now the two remaining squares that go with that goose, I'm just gonna leave to the side and I'm gonna grab another big square grab another small square and line up my geese or my um, sky part on the corner and I've left myself two or three threads on the very edge both directions and so about halfway across then line up my second small square and if I have done a good job drawing my lines on that line will line up across there so I'm just going to go from one small square to the next small square and those lines should line up right across there and now I'm going to grab my batik one just because of the way I've done this I'm going to put this the side of my square that does not have the pinked edges on the outside but I'm still leaving myself that little bit of extra room on the edge you can see the back square on the two sides of my small square. I just think it's um, easier to line that up the way I want it to if I'm not trying to work around those pinked edges. And now I'm going to do the same thing with this one. I'm leaving myself some space out here and this is going to line up right uh, across and I'll just go from one to the other. Now I'm going to just stop and I'm going to sew across the bottom. 
think I'm going to go back the other direction. Notice I did assembly line style sewing. That's always more efficient if you can do that. I'm going to turn around and turn the iron on real quick where it can heat up while I'm finishing that. And again, I'm going to stitch right onto that line. You want that to be a nice skinny channel. So that is one reason I use a very fine tipped pin. You could use a pencil. Um, if you do, you want to use a, a mechanical pencil where it's always sharp. I'm going to get to the other side and I'm going to park my needle in my fabric tag. So I've got the start of three sets and we talked about making three sets of geese. Each set with the technique we're using will be four matching geese for this project. We've all over the country. Tony said we have people from Florida, Wyoming, and California. So, all right, let me adjust this just a little bit so you can see a little better. So, I am ready to cut these apart, and I'm going to cut corner to corner. You want to grab something that's big enough to protect your fingers. So, this is not the time to use your Quilter's Magic Wand. I broke mine in half. I don't know if um, all of you have been watching long enough to know the reason I had a short one. I um, found that I tend to make the geese this size or maybe one size bigger, but I didn't need a long magic wand for most of my projects. So I just broke one in half. So now I have two partial geese or um, quilter's magic wand that I can do flying geese. I can do um, half square triangles, anything that I need a Quilter's Magic wand to mark with. I like the little bit shorter one. So I'm just giving this a little bit of a finger press, set the iron on it while it's working. I'll give this a little bit of a finger press. I like to do a little finger pressing because I tend not to distort um, as badly when I press if I do that. So I give it just a little finger pressing time. And once I get all um, three of these done, then I'll grab my acorn pressing pin. And by the way, while I'm doing that, I will tell you, if you haven't been to our website lately to look at our um, schedule, I have some actual classes um, scheduled. You can take them here at the shop if you're local. Um, we're so glad that we feel like COVID's over enough that we can go back to a semi-normal type schedule. Um, but we have decided to continue with the hybrid classes. That means if you're in Florida or Wyoming or California, you could take the class with us at the same time via Zoom. So that is a possibility. Um, the classes that I'm offering are different than what I do on our YouTube videos and our uh, Live at Five. So that's something that you can think about and look at. Um, there's a couple of the projects that we're going to do classes for that I don't have the project completed, but um, I'm getting close. So, so now I have my sections. Let me go back out a little bit. And they kind of look like a half of a heart on all of my sections or a fox face. I've heard some people say that. And I'm just going to stack them up. I like to stack them up with the big triangle at the top because that's the way I'm actually going to feed them through the machine. So I'm going to get ready to put the other square on. This time, I've got this corner that I'm going to leave that little bit of space there so I make sure that I have a little bit of wiggle room. It helps with the trimming later. If um, you've ever put this right at the edge, you probably will find you don't have quite enough room to trim properly. So that's why you want to leave that little bit of space on the outside edge. So now I'm ready to stitch. I'm going to come in a little closer so you can see a little better, and maybe I can see a little better. 
and then I'm going to stitch right down that line and I'm going to grab the next one so California and Wyoming and Florida I know we've had several that have been watching from Florida and then we've also had some from Arizona and I know that there are some from Texas as well so it's always nice to hear where everybody's from say that again oh Tony says I'm supposed to talk about the baby foxes if you've watched um, our shop Facebook page or my personal Facebook page we had a family of foxes on the hillside outside the shop um, and what we discovered I've got one that I did not draw my lines on somehow I missed it um, what we discovered is evidently foxes are known to come uh, close to people to have their babies because that way it helps keep them away from the predators, coyotes, and that sort of thing. And when the babies get big enough that they can kind of fend for themselves, then they leave and you don't see them anymore. So we had a family of, we don't know exactly, but there were two adults and five babies. So we don't know if it was a mom and a daddy and five babies or two mamas and two litters or what. But they are very cute to watch, but they are very destructive. They all but tore up our flower beds because they would run and play and hide behind a bush and then jump out at each other and it was fun to watch them but they um they are gone now okay so now here this one i said i was going to line this up with this pointed edge at the corner notice how i put my lines on this one so i can't do that i'm just going to have to wing it but I'm still leaving myself that little bit of space on the corner so that I have room for trimming later. Ohio and Georgia, goodness. Okay, so now I've got my last one and I've got, um, I've got my pinked edges on this side and that's okay, that makes it easier to line up. Now I actually am probably going to use several different, um, I'm going to call them shirtings, the light creamy colored fabric. It's actually a print, but on screen it may look solid. I'll show you which one I'm talking about when I get to it. Um, I'm going to use several different shirting type prints on my project. Uh, my batik one, I'll find something to do with these geese, but it's not going on my duck duck goose quilt. Um, you can always make a nice throw pillow out of the pieces we're making, or they make great table runners as well. This is the one I'm talking about. There's a little bitty print. You can see that. Um, the little print, I will probably have several different little prints because it's going to take um, a yard, a yard and a half of that for um, one of the projects. If you do the big duck duck goose project, it may take more than that, but I'm still, part of the reason it's sort of a mystery is I'm still working it all out in my head. I've got some of it figured out and some of it I'm, I make it up as I go along. So uh, this is my last one and notice I've made three sets of geese and it really hasn't taken very long if, if I wasn't talking and demonstrating I could have done it um, really pretty fast so I'm going to cut these apart I've parked my needle and those of you who don't use a fabric tag it's a great habit to get into because your work is tidier you don't have as much of a problem with stitching onto a corner like this if you have a machine that has a ten tendency to eat the fabric as it feeds through this is when it's going to do it. So the fabric tag helps that uh, problem. So I'm ready to take this to my ironing surface. Again, I'm going to grab something I can use as a cutting guide. And it just so happens I have my wing clipper close at hand so I can cut corner to corner in between my lines of stitching. And 
put these together. Once I get them all cut, then I'm ready to press and trim. And I'll show you how you line up your pieces for trimming. One more. So even if, I, I'm going to go back to YouTube and subscribing. Even if you don't regularly watch us on YouTube, navigate over to YouTube and subscribe just to let YouTube know that we are using it and um, it just helps the algorithms direct people to our site. So I'm going to finger press these and I just stack them up like this. When you're finger pressing, you want to use short little strokes with your fingernail. If I start down here and just rip right along that, I'm not doing myself much good to finger press it because I'm um, very likely to distort that bias seam. And I tend to just stack them up like this. This is also something I could do at the um, sewing machine and do my finger pressing there. We're going to get the last few done and I'm going to end up with three sets of geese. I'll have to make another set to actually go in my block because I need three coordinated sets. Um, coordinated just meaning that I would want them in the same quilt and I probably wouldn't put these three in the same quilt. So you never know. I've been known to do things like that. So now that I've got them finger pressed, I can just set the iron on them and give them a little time under the iron. And after I've got them finger pressed, I can actually just stack them up and I press two, I'm pressing two of them at a time without any trouble. If you're using steam, you want to steam your fabric before you ever cut anything. Um, on this particular uh, piece. I've lost my acorn pressing pen. Um, on this particular piece, I did not use steam because I didn't use steam when I started. But now I can go back with the acorn pe pressing pen, give it just a little bit of solution. It doesn't take a lot to give it just enough help to lay down nice and flat. So by the way, all of the tools that I show you are available here at the shop. All of that fabric I showed you at the beginning, that's also available, but I will tell you the Tula Pink fabric won't stay around for long. So if that's something that interests you, you need to order soon or come by the shop so you can see it in person. And so I've got all of my flying geese pressed nice and flat and I'm ready to trim. So when I get ready to trim, I'm going to be using my um, wing clipper tool and on this particular um, size I am making a uh, one and a half by three inch finished flying goose. That means I need to trim this to a half inch bigger than that. Let me get the gray mat because it's even though that's a cream colored um, background it's hard to see on that white mat. So I've got um, a three and a half by two inch um, rectangle on the corner of my wing clipper tool. All I really have to do though is put this long diagonal line on the right seam and then find the line that crosses it that fits the best. And you'll be able to tell pretty quickly if you get it on there and there's lots to trim away, you know it's, you're probably not on the right line. If you get it here and there's nothing to trim away at the corner, you've gone too far. So I can line this up and once I get it in, my, in the right place, it should line up on both seams and have just a sliver to trim all the way around that three and a half by two inch rectangle. And by the way, if you're left-handed, there are left-hand instructions and I'll show you in just a second. So there's my three and a half by two when I get it placed uh, back on here, there's a bold X right at the tip, so I know I'm not going to chop off my goose's beak. I have a perfectly trimmed flying goose. So if you're left-handed, 
simply turn your tool vertical and lay your goose pointing to the right. So once you get that long common diagonal in line, I moved my mat if I got it there, and put the cross mark here, you're going to trim up the long side and across the short. I'm not going to try that. Put it back the way I need to have it for um, a right-handed cutter. I'm going to trim and trim. I'm going to trim one of each color just for time's sake. Do I have questions about the Wing Clipper tool? No. By the way, there is a tool called Wing Clipper 2. It is the in-between sizes. You're not going to use it as often simply because there aren't as many projects that use that size. So it's handy to have, but I tell people wait until you have a project that you need that size and then purchase that tool. It's not something you use real often. There are a few designers that tend to like those sizes. There again, see the bold marking at the tip. The three and a half by two is where I'm lining up on the bottom of my rectangle. And notice this was the one that had the pinked edges. It's not a problem because I'm going to trim that part away anyway. And I end up with a perfectly trimmed goose ready to use for my project. All right, so next week um, we're going to be working on another unit that will be used with three sets of coordinated geese. Now they actually could be all the same. I could have made um, three sets of geese with the same, square, the same colored squares. So that is an option for you as well. Um, and you will I'll have a new um, Google file to put uh, instructions in and as we go I'll be adding things to that file. I do send an email to people that have asked to be on the email group for our Live at Five Sew Along so if you would like to be at that group let me know. Other than that I'll send them again to the people who've been in it before. If you decide that you don't want to continue to be in that group let me know that and we'll fix that for you. So until next week Happy sewing, come and see us, and um, we will see you next week, live at 5.